Hi, I'm Cindy Miller, Director of Children's Ministry. And I'm Lauren White, Director of Christian Education here at Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church School and Child Care. We are so glad you have joined us on our Bible exploration as we learn more about God's love. This month, we are talking all about monsters. The world can be a scary place between school, COVID, making new friends, and storms. There's a lot out there we might be afraid of. But when we trust in God, He will help us overcome things that scare us. God wants to comfort us when we're scared. And here's the good news. He can use scary situations for good. So stick around this month to see how God uses scary situations for good throughout the Bible in the life of David. Coming soon to a theater near you, it's a story of terror, so frightening, so scary. It will make you terrified of what happens next. It's the story of a young woman who was deathly afraid of the thing she didn't know. Oh no, I don't like storms. How long is it going to last? Is it gonna end? Is there gonna be a tornado? Bad things always happen during storms. Bad things. Why any moment something bad could show up right at my door? Who's there? Who's outside my door in this horrible storm? I'm so scared. What happens when you can't see the future? When you can't see what lies on the other side of the door, you too will be scared of the thing she didn't know. Go away! I have a baseball butt! Yeah, and I get a taser gun! I'll use them! Just go away! I don't want to die! Oh no! They're calling me! Why don't they just go away? Is it a monster, a vampire, 
a zombie invasion? She couldn't even look because she was too afraid of the thing she didn't know. Nancy, are you okay? Oh, Tina, thank goodness you're okay. They're after me. Who's after you? I don't know. They were at my door, and then they were calling my phone. I just knew it was the end. Nancy, that was me. I was coming over to wish you a happy birthday. Y you were? And look, I brought you a present. A present? What's in it? It's a surprise! <laughs> It's the story of a woman so scared of the future, she was even terrified of her own birthday presents. Enter the world of the woman who was afraid of the thing she didn't know. It's nothing to be scared of, Freddy Cat. Look, it's a new mystery book. A book? For me? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Happy birthday. Phew. Just a book. My name is Detective Jim Spade. There's been a murder at the Marley Manor and it's my job to solve it. The only question is, can I solve it before the killer strikes again? I don't know. I don't know. Ah! The thing she didn't know. Opening everywhere on an undetermined future day. Don't tell your friends how it ends. How many of you guys like mystery stories? Anyone? Mysteries are a lot of fun, whether they're on TV, and the movies, or in books. A good mystery keeps you in suspense all the way to the very end. It keeps you guessing about what will happen next and how the mystery will be solved. Of course, if you're a person who doesn't like suspense, reading a mystery novel comes with a unique challenge. Anytime you pick up the book and you hold the answer to the mystery in your hands, it's right here at the back of the book. How many of you want to just open to the back of the book and look at the very end? Too bad you can't. A little suspense in a mystery novel can be a lot of fun. But when we let the fear of the unknown consume us, it can be a real problem. God doesn't want us to be afraid of the future. He doesn't want us to be worried about what will happen next. God wants us to focus on him. He wants us to trust him to take care of us now and in the future. He doesn't want us trying to sneak, sneak a peek at the end. He wants us to love him and trust him where we are. There's no harm in looking at the end of a mystery book. True mystery readers place themselves in the hands of their favorite writers, trusting that the author will give them a great story. We can trust ourselves in God's hands, knowing that he will work out the ending for us as well. Have you ever known someone who loved a sport or a team so much they would record a game and watch it later? They want to see the game in its entirety. They want to enjoy all the tension, the worry, and the suspense of the live game, even though it's no longer live. Those wacky sports fans actually have a lot in common with mystery lovers. People who read mystery books and watch mysteries on TV enjoy the suspense of not knowing what's coming. They don't want anyone to tell them what is coming. When it comes to real life, however, almost no one feels the same way about the future. We like to know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and how it's going to happen. 
but more often than not, we don't know these things. Accidents happen. Unexpected events happen. We don't like it, but there's nothing we can do to stop it. God doesn't let us peek at the future for some reason. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to be content knowing He is in control. He wants us to do the right thing. And He wants us to trust Him to work things out. As we pick up the story of David today, he's living in the great unknown. The general who became a hero is now on the run from King Saul. King Saul has become so jealous of David that he is actually hunting for him and trying to kill him. But even in his darkest hour, David trusts God enough to let God have his way. When Saul heard that David had gone to Keilah, a city surrounded by gates and bars, he thought that he had gained the upper hand. God has delivered him into my hands, Saul said. Saul called up all his forces to battle David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting against him. He said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod. David prayed for wisdom, asking, Lord, will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Will the people of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? The Lord told David that Saul was coming and that the people would surrender them over to Saul. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah. When Saul was told that David had escaped from the city, he did not go there. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Sif, he learned that Saul had come to kill him. Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord before Jonathan returned home, leaving David out in the wilderness with his men. The Ziphites came to Saul and said, David is hiding in the strongholds at Horish. Come down whenever it pleases you, and we will give him into your hands. Saul blessed them for their offer and said, Go and get more information. They tell me David is very crafty. Find out about all the hiding places he uses and come back to me with definite information. Then I will go with you. If he is in the area, I will track him down among all the clans of Judah. So the Ziphites set out ahead of Saul to gather information on David. Saul and his men then began their search, and when David was told about it, he went down to the rock and stayed in the desert of Maon. When Saul heard this, he went into the desert of Maon in pursuit of David. Saul was going along one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side, hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his forces were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, Come quickly, the Philistines are raiding the land. Then Saul broke off his pursuit of David and went to fight off the invading Philistines. Once Saul had taken care of the Philistine threat, he was told that David was now in the desert of Engedi. Saul called up 3,000 of his best men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the wild goat's rocks. Along the way, Saul came to the sheep pens where there was a cave nearby. Saul went into the cave to relieve himself, not knowing that David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, feeling guilty for having cut off a corner of Saul's robe, David forbid his men to attack Saul. Saul left the cave and went on his way unharmed. 
Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord the king! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and put his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? Even though the Lord delivered you to my hands, and some of my men told me to kill you, I spared your life. As proof of his story, David held up the piece of Saul's robe he had cut off and said, I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. David explained that he had done nothing to deserve being hunted down. May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand, David said. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, Saul said. May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Saul asked David to swear not to kill off his family when he took the throne, and David agreed. This is kind of a funny story, isn't it? Here's Big Bad Saul out on a mission to kill David. He walks right into the cave where David's hiding. David's men wanted to kill Saul, but David refused. He trusted that God would make him king at the right time. David didn't know if Saul would kill him once he left the cave. He didn't know if Saul would give up his hunt. He didn't, but he trusted God and he was content to wait on God to have his way. That is why David not only became king, but also was described as a man after God's own heart. He didn't panic. He didn't worry. In the darkest time, when he could not see the future, he trusted God right where he was. It would be nice to know the future, wouldn't it? Be nice to know if you're moving, or keeping your friends, or if everyone will get well. But God doesn't let us see those things. He doesn't let us see them because He doesn't want us worrying about them. He wants us to focus on Him. When you find yourself afraid of the future, I want you to remember three things. You can trust in the Lord God. You can tell God what is causing you to be afraid. And remember, God loves you and he will always be with you. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for always being there when we're afraid. Help us to place our trust in you. Amen. Did we get through it all? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's all of it. That's two weeks.
Before we say goodbye, let's work on our October Bible verse. It goes like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. Now I'd like you to say it with me. We'll do it several times. I'll say some of it and you can repeat it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. Psalm 27, 1. Let's try it again one more time. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. Psalm 27, 1. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to keep up to date with all of the children's ministry resources. See you next week!